Okay, we are recording. David, how are you? Good. Um, sorry, someone's just buzzing me on my phone. I'm now switching it off. <laughs> yes, I'm good. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's um, it's it's wonderful to to have you join us for the podcast. Um, and you've already sent your your tracks over to me, and I've had a look, and uh, and I'm very very excited to discuss them today. And okay, let's jump, let's jump straight in and uh, and get the playlist started because I always ask guests to kick off the playlist with the song that they regard as having the greatest ever intro. Please, song that made you gasp. Uh, this year, I mean, this is a cracker. Okay. So the, the the song that has the greatest ever intro, please. Let's go crazy by Prince. Um, I would argue for. Um, I remember the first time that I heard that um, very specifically. I was in Guyana. I was at home in a suburb of Georgetown, the capital called South Rhinevelt. I was alone. My mother was at work. My sister was at school. So I'm not sure what I was doing at home. But um, I had the radio on, um, GB, GBC, Guyana Broadcasting Corporation, and this song just came out of the speakers and uh the best description the description i always use is that it just pinned me to the wall it's like what the hell is that it sounded like somebody had baked a cassette in the sun and put it on it was playing and then this thing just unfolded on the radio and um it began with him saying, um, dearly beloved, we are gathered here today, get through the thing called life, electric world life, it means I'm a long time, but I hear day that there's something else in the afterworld, and I was like, oh. And then that guitar solo, and it was just the most extraordinary record I had ever heard in my life. Um, and I don't, I wouldn't say that my musical taste was really that developed then. And then right at the end of it, they said, and that was Prince. So it's the first time that I ever heard Prince. And, you know, I really treasure that moment because I was alone when I heard Prince for the first time. And what's interesting about that is that it wasn't the first time that I saw him um, because um, my friends at school all had magazines of this really strange looking man who kind of fascinated me because he was different yeah. to everything that I expected from um, Black American R&B singers at that period. Um, they were all very 80s, you know, Jerry Curl and um, sharp sort of Michael Jackson-esque leathers and whatnot. But Prince was walking around with his pubes showing in a trench coat and long boots. And it was like, yeah. what is this guy? And so from that to hearing him on the radio for the first time, and from that day, I became uh, something of a devotee, I would say. Yeah, I mean, what an introduction to Prince. Let's go crazy. No, what are you, it, it, I, I mean, really, of all of the introductions to any song I can ever think of, that's just got to be the most perfect. Alone, darning a sock, you know, completely unexpected, you know, completely uninvited and just there. And that, well, it it is one of the greatest introductions. So I mean, it's the first thing, first thing that came to mind when I looked at the list. It was like, great introduction. Let's go crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. Do you know what, David? I've, I've done over 500 of these, these episodes now, and no one's chose that. And I'm stunned because it's it's so iconic. And it's so... <laughs> and, 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 and I'm always curious as to what side of the, the intro people lean on, because a lot of the time people go for these kind of like long, stretched intros, like Let's Go Crazy, whereas some people right, right. go, help by the Beatles, just bang straight in. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so with, with that in mind, when you're making music and... And, and, and the way that people would have been listening to music when your career first started to have people listen to music now, the, the way in which it's done is, is by lots of different formats now. We're seeing that a lot of songwriters are utilising things like TikTok and, and to, to, to get their, their music out there. And obviously there's Spotify playlists now, which are apparently quite important in getting your music out to, to, to more people rather than perhaps when... Um, your career started when there was still, I, I guess, people were still leaning towards you know, getting playlisted on, on radio stations and the music press and such like that. Um, the fact that the more modern trends, whether it's trying to grab people via Spotify or, you know, these rapid thumbs that you're seeing on, on telephones with TikTok and things like that, it, it seems that the, the kind of 
the, the, the sort of attention span is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And and that does seem to be represented in representing in, in maybe commercial pop music, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm really taking my time with this question, but I'm gonna get there in the end, David. And I just want to know, like, with your creative process, does any of these trends in in how people are getting their music filter through into your creative process anymore? Um, well, for one thing, I would say that you have to be prepared to uh, not have your entire album listened to anymore. Um, and it's very much about uh, making sure that um, every track is um great but then that's all that, that, that that's always been the case anyway but i do remember a time where i treated some things like b-sides like you know specifically making a b-side but 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 but, but i wouldn't say that i do that anymore um is that a good I, or a bad thing what's that do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing that that, that the albums aren't necessarily seen as a, a piece of art and a body of work maybe as much as they used to be and and the, the importance of the b-side because it was it was access to more music and and it felt like there was a little hidden secret on the flip side of the of the single i just wonder what your thoughts are on that i don't really feel that there's a great deal that we can do about the um march of time i mean i think uh if this period that we're living in now has taught me anything and not just the technology, but if you think about something like Brexit, for example, I was born before we went in and I've lived long enough to see us go out. And I mean, the thing about living is that change happens. So this popular song, uh, long player album does seem to be a phenomenon of the 20th century. And we're in the 21st now, things are going to change and people aren't going to consume uh, in the way that they did. So I think for those of us who've traversed from the 20th century to the 21st, there is some frustration. But I mean, I, I, I do think we have to get rid of the times. I mean, the other thing that I do is I, I have a process that I call real thoughts in real time. But some people have said it's just like it's exactly what David Bowie did. But if I have any unforced thoughts that sound good to me, I write them down in my smartphone. And um, I've, I've got this massive list of um, things that um, I've said, oh, well, that sounds like a good idea. The minute I start to work on it and change it into something, I stop because it's like I'm contrived. So the uncontrived ideas all get stored in my smartphone. And then when I sit down with Sean to write, um, it's like I go straight to my smartphone and see which um, um, lyrics stick and which ones don't. The other thing is that recently Sean and I decided that we wanted to create a chant, write a song that was a chant, and we um, decided that we do it with AI. Now, there's a lot of scaremongering about AI, and I, and I think that we probably do have uh, good reason for concern, but at the same time, I think that if you just want to like get um, some essential words, that you can have a chat with AI as an assistant. And... Um, I've been doing that quite a bit recently, and it's like having a conversation with Wikipedia. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I think, think you know, um, we can all be Luddites, and I am a Luddite in many ways. I mean, my music taste strains after 2010. I mean, it's a definite change. I'm 56, I'm set in my ways. I know what I like. A lot of what I hear is like, oh, yes, but I remember Bowie doing that in this year and blah, and blah, 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 blah. And um, uh, because of that decentralization, um, I don't feel that I have the need for television anymore. The water cooler has basic, ba basically um, evaporated, vanished. It's like a, um, you have, we all live these bespoke technological lives now. So, you know, you speak about Spotify playlists. I know people who like to sit in front of YouTube for a couple of hours on a Saturday night. Yeah. I know some people who like to kind of just like collect the vinyl that they haven't had. I mean, but we're in the 21st, we're, we're, we're 23 years into the 21st century now. So um, I don't think um, I, I can get too hung up on the fact that um, albums aren't as important to listeners as they once were. Okay. But it makes sense that they were important to my mum. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's go back and, and, and talk about all of you. That was a long-winded answer. <laughs> it was a long-winded question. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> David, can you tell me the first song uh, that you remember that had an emotional impact on you, please? 
Yeah, um, I, it was 1975. I was at home in Norfolk with my mother and my sister. My sister had just discovered crochet and I seem to remember my mother and my sister working on this like really fabulous kind of lots of purples and blues and reds um, crochet quilt thing. And um, Top of the Pops was on and there was this guy and I don't remember his face as much as I remember the light on his shiny curly hair. And this sound was just coming out of him. And um, I would say that was the day that, that that the idea of doing that myself became really interesting. And it was um, a song that I had heard, of, I, I, I couldn't tell you how long before, but I had heard it before in an old black and white Busby Berkeley film, one of the Gold Diggers films. And it was another version of that. And it was Art Garfunkel singing, I Only Have Eyes For You, which if anybody asks, is my favorite song, is, is my favorite record ever. And there have been people who've been disappointed by that because they think that because I am what I am, but I should say Marvin Gaye or Stevie Wonder or something. But actually, I, I, I can't think of a record that I love as much as that, other than the version of it that I heard from the Flamingos. Um, so um, I've got two favourite records, the Flamingos version of I Only Have Eyes For You and Art Garfunkel's, but I think that art has the edge. It's just a, um, a, a, I suppose, people call me the Croydon Choir Boys sometimes. And I think, when I think of Art Garfunkel, I think of an overgrown choir boy, like a, or a fiery angel. Yeah, yeah. If I had to ask you, Gary, to sort of pinpoint the emotion what would it be? Um, transportation, escape. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking? Um, transcendence. Um, uh, e elevation above the ordinary, mundane, into a very magical world. Yeah. I think lots of records do that, but I think that he does it in a really exquisite way. In that voice. I mean that 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 voice is absolutely one of my favorites of all time, based on this one song, because I have actually sought out other Art Garfunkel records and they don't quite rise to this occasion for me. And some people think he's cheesy. I think he's amazing with Paul Simon. And in some respects, I think that I've it took me years to notice how nuanced and how good a singer Paul Simon was mm -hmm. because Art Garfunkel was in the way. Yeah. But, um yeah, it uh it was it it, it 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 it's a transporting vocal. It uh, yeah, it's like it's it's like a song from another world. That, that that that's what I would say. That's the best way to describe a good record. If it's otherworldly, I think that's what mm. makes something so beautiful. Mm. David, Beauty. You yeah, absolutely. You, you you mentioned Norfolk. Um, yes. So is that where growing up was? No, I was born in Croydon and I moved to Norfolk probably when I was about seven or eight. Uh, my mother decided to get out of Croydon and move to a seaside town, as you do. <laughs> yeah. How was that? Uh, interesting. I was the only black boy in my school. Yeah. And it was the same for my sister. And um, I think historically, the thing I remember most was Roots. And I think Roots was... 75 or 76 but there was this really intrusive curiosity on my first day I mean we're talking about being in the playground surrounded by students speaking about you as an object and feeling your hair and saying oh his hair is really spongy isn't it I'm like a really kind of um, unabashed curiosity from these kids and then Roots came onto TV and it was a different, um, it, it, it was as if though the kids in the playground suddenly realized where I came from. Yeah. And it was quite painful personally, because um, it meant that I spent a good six months being called Toby and Kunta Kinte. And my sister, um, you know, this, at the school she went to got called Kizzy. And um, it was, uh, I, I remember once one kid coming up to me once and saying they'd gotten rid of people. You know, and he was talking about his father being a, me a member of the National Front. <laughs> so yeah, it was chal it, 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 it was challenging, but uh, um, good geographical location to have on the CV. So, so 
sorry, David, don't we? Two seconds. I'm just aware that my microphone cut out is. Hopefully, you can, you can hear me a little better now. Uh, I can. Oh, fantastic. Much better. Um, when you when you was at school, and I, mm. I, I, I presume, I mean, the, the, the time scale that you're, you're talking about there was, you know, I, I guess was the, the, the period where the National Front was probably peaking towards the sort of mid 70s to, to late 70s. And, uh, and I can't imagine how, how, how that, that must have felt. But uh, uh, on the actual sort of side of sort of what you wanted to do and what you wanted to be, um, was you formulating your own kind of ideas then as, as to what you wanted to do when you left school at that point? No, I mean, I think I'm somebody who, as it has, is constantly surprised by what I'm, what, what I have been capable of, and there were things that I was good at, and um, people who weren't me noticed that, and um, it took me, it's taken me years to appreciate that I could um, read, write, sing. Um, because I didn't feel as if those uh, those things were taken seriously when I was a child by anybody in particular. But I think also one of the things that you seem to be um, picking up on is that I did actually retreat into a sort of a fantasy world because, um, you know, um, it wasn't always friendly. And um, it was very it, it, it was it was very difficult for my mother because she was a single mother. And so um, on TV, there was a lot of escape. And in that scenario, I guess, I began to absorb the idea that entertainment was something that I could do. But I, but, 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 but I wouldn't have said that I was um, aware of being cap a capable singer at the time. Was any of those sort of more creative and artistic sides of, you know, your personality encouraged at school yeah I mean I, I remember standing on stage in a church and reading Psalm 23 and um, being selected to participate in the Christmas play but um, all of this struck me as mysterious like why are they asking me um, I think the other really important thing was that my sister and um I'm sure I've asked her, but I've forgotten why she suddenly became obsess obsessed with a Madonna and child. And she was painting it constantly. Like she'd come home and just start drawing the Madonna and child. And my mother's friend um, started giving her Italian postcards of um, Italian painters. And uh, that once again, I was when I got back from Guyana in '87 and started going to European museums and galleries, I was recognizing all of these paintings and somehow forgetting that my sister was a person who attuned me to them. And um, in the last few years, I've, I've been doing a lot more work um, in terms of art and art history. And um, I'm very clear now that this is absolutely something that began with my sister in that moment where she had that. Um, she, she's an artist now. and yeah. and. and and an illustrator absolutely began in that moment where she was completely fascinated by that iconography. Well, we're talking uh, so much about school. Can you tell me the song that reminds you of your time at school, please? Well, um, I went to Broadmead Primary School and then I went to Peterhouse School in Norfolk and then I went to um, Grove primary in Guyana and then I went to secondary school at Queen's College so this is a selection from that and the reason that I've chosen it is because I remember it representing this moment of really shocking transition and um, when I got to Guyana it was all about Bob Marley and Peter Tosh and artists like that your more melodic reggae music and then it seemed that one day um, there was this tune and it was immediately followed by another tune about diseases, the most dangerous diseases. I don't know if you know the, the most dangerous diseases uh, and be, be, about being afflicted with poliomyelitis and all of these um, itises. <laughs> and uh, over and, and, and that, that, that seemed to herald the arrival of dance hall. 
it was Bunny Waylo who was associated with a particular kind of reggae doing something that sounded very hip hop. And then bang, overnight, these really nice churchy um, school children were doing the most outrageous things on the dance floor to this new thing called da da dance hall. And then people like Yellow Man, you yeah. know, um, became these huge stars. But this Back to School by Bunny Whaler seems to have been um, the um, signaling that something really massive was about to change in Jamaican music. Did you, as he got to sort of towards the end of school, was you starting to sort of sing more then, and and, and, and was you aware of of what you could do? Uh, you, there there was an incident in a music class where we were doing um, close to you, as as, as as a school choir, and um, carpenters. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and my music teacher. Avis Joseph, she sort of like said, who is that? And everybody stopped. <laughs> and then it was a case of, um, what? No, no, no one's going to admit to that. And she wouldn't say what it was that she heard. But um, over time, she sort of like kept us all back until it was about five boys left in the room. And I was one of them. And at, by that point, we were like, you know, we're all like going, good I mean. <laughs> we were like you know what have we done she wouldn't say yeah and then um in the end i just thought okay just let rib just like me and they said mccalmont it's you and i'm like oh, what have i done and I, and I, and and then i said um what what is it after everybody left i said i'm, I'm sorry but, but, but why did you single me out just then and she said because you have a beautiful voice and i wanted to know who it was you should always own up to a voice like that and um i started singing in church but the thing I remember about Guyana was that you had to um, be a local version of a big star. And uh, so you had a really good friend of mine, Aubrey de Guiar. He was the local Stevie Wonder, which meant that if anybody else was going around singing Stevie Wonder um, songs, they kind of had to get his permission. Because it's like, you know, that's, that's, that's my book. Yeah. yeah. And of course, I mean, um, I think at that time, um, my favorite singer was Whitney Houston. And there was absolutely no way that I could be the local Whitney Houston. Yeah. And I remember the, 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 I, I went back to Guyana recently about five years ago and karaoke has taken over. I mean, I, honestly, I need to go to Japan to just see how prevalent karaoke is there because Guyana is very much its second territory. And I think that's very much linked to the fact that the big names never came. And yeah. so people, um, you know, had their songs that they were known for. My mother was known when she was a child for singing Walking My Baby Back Home, in, um, you know, in, in, in her village in the 1930s. So, um, yeah, I... Um, Went, went into a karaoke bar and I said, I'm going to do Whitney. And I did Saving All My Love For You. <laughs> I remember these people sort of like stopping on the street and, and saying, is that man, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, so talking about those early days at school where, you, you know, you realised that you was going to complete minority uh, and, 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 that that must have been so difficult, and and to then sort of you know feel reluctant to put your hand up and say yeah that was me singing. Where did where did the confidence come from that as a as a fan of your music you know from the very first time I saw you on television I was like there's a front man and you know you seem to just pour confidence in in, in your performance, and I just wonder where that come from. Um, church, probably. Uh, I accepted Christ as my personal saviour at the Assemblies of God in Georgetown on when I was 13 years old. And um, in church, they have this thing called choruses, which is also how I learned to play the tambourine. And um, slowly, um, I took a lot of knocks, a lot of people, um, because the aim then was to um, sing under something called the anointing. And um, I really wanted, you know, I really aspired to singing under the anointing. Um, and in Guyana, it wasn't a TV country. There was no TV um, unless you had a lot of money and you could afford 
pay one of the men who was one of the gangsters who was pirating TV. Um, but my mother w w wasn't like that. So um, but there was a lot of focus on music and I sang a lot at church. And um, slowly, eventually, I began to get a lot of encouragement. And um, in church, um, I, 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 I became the guy who sang El Shaddai. There's a famous um, contemporary Christian singer in um, the, the United States called, <laughs> I wonder what you would make of this, called Amy Grant. And I loved Amy Grant. And she did this beautiful song called El Shaddai. And whenever I sang it, it really moved people. And that um, kind of modest success meant that I tried other material, but it didn't always work. But whenever I sang El Shaddai, it really um, moved people. And I think that's where the confidence with the ballad and nerviness about taking on up-tempo tracks came from. Yeah. You know, I think I'm more up for doing the up-tempo stuff now than I've ever been in my life. It's taken me this long. Yeah, okay. Mm. Tell me the first song you remember buying from a record store, please, David. Well, um, okay. The first record I ever bought, personally, or if someone I, you you can have one that was gifted to you, and you can have one that you bought. Yeah, this this has really confused me because the first time I, um was moved by a celebrity death, as it were, was um, Elvis Presley. Yeah, I remember going to the toy shop to buy Duke Marbles. I don't know, do you remember Duke Marbles? No, explain. When we were playing marbles, you know you got those ones with the color in the middle? Yeah. Well, they called them Dukes, but they were just the marble with nothing in them. Wow. And I was fascinated by them. And I got some pocket money and I went to the toy shop to buy a bag because I just love to look at them and play. I, I never played marbles in my life. <laughs> and um, I remember being in the toy store and the radio saying that Elvis Presley had just died. This was 1977, so I was 10. And like, you know, um, beginning to cry, going home and raising a, a glass of water to him with my sister and like saying, you know, um, long live the king or something like that. Um, and I remember this record from that period, but um, it's the month after he died. And the month after he died, there seems to have been a crowd of, um, I, I think it was about nine albums in the top 40 and about 20 yeah. some singles. And this was one of them. And um, the only thing I can tell you is that my mother had really erratic um, taste choices. I mean, all of the albums were the crooners. Um, but, but but the cheesy crooners, right? So my mother was um, Bing Crosby, um, Perry Como, yeah. um, Dean Martin. Um, I can still listen to Ber Perry Como, but I don't I don't listen to Bing and Dean anymore. But I think my mother's best um, taste as as far as crooners go was Tony Bennett. Yeah. But she bought all of these singles, and Return to the Sender was is 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 one of the ones that I I, I remember really enjoying. Wonderful. What a record. But then much later, when I, when I was at high school, I bought In Square Circle by Stevie Wonder. That was my first, the first time I spent money on a record. And obviously, you wasn't allowed to be Stevie Wonder because someone else had, had, had got that, right? That was someone yes. else's gig. And uh, you had to be Whitney. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> but tell me about uh -huh. um, uh, the, the importance of, of, of Stevie Wonder uh, for you. Was Stevie an artist at that point? You know, much like Prince, you become a, a, a lifelong fan of. Um, Prince felt more like a cult. Yeah. Whereas, why why um, do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Because I think that's a really interesting thing you just said there. Because uh, uh, much like you, you know, uh, uh, we're a very similar age and, and seeing Prince, you know, uh, in the, the the first time I seen him would have been around about that time as well, and it would have been on top of the pops, and it would have been seeing the video to When Doves Cry with all the scenes from um, Purple Rain, and just thinking, who's this guy on this motorbike that just looks fucking otherworldly? Like <laughs> I, I, I couldn't understand what I was watching, and, and I couldn't take my eyes off him, and and it was absolutely fantastic, and and it felt like I, I, I guess. It just felt a little weirder 
And and I think when you're young, you, you're always a little bit drawn. Well, I certainly was to the, the, the weirder, darker things that you think, oh, what's going on there? That that's a bit strange. I can't put that in a box. And I, and I think like that's why it kind of I, I, when you said about cult sort of status, I thought, yeah, that's exactly how I saw it. Yeah. Um, well, I think that's it. I think I remember having an argument with a school friend once about who was better. You know, and uh, it was um, later I, fa I found out that this was actually quite a wide conversation, but it was, um, um, and, and the media were, um, the, the, the magazines were definitely engaged in it, this kind of pitting Prince against Michael Jackson. Yeah. And his argument was that Michael Jackson has sold more. What does that tell you? And um, my argument was that Prince was the more talented. He played guitar. He was more experimental and so on. But I think um, that, I don't know, it, it, it might be a bit like Sly and the Family Stone. Um, it's, um, I mean, I, I, I saw Lionel Richie at the Ivan Velo Awards a few years ago, getting his Lifetime Achievement Award, and he spoke about how Black Radio told him his career was over because he um, released um, a ballad. He was talking about Once, Twice, Three Times a Lady. Yeah. Um, it was like um, Black Radio was like, no, we don't do that. And then you think about Whitney being booed at the Black Music Awards because of, the, of, of her sound. I think Prince sort of fell in the same category. It's like, uh, well, he was probably the first axe, black axe hero after Hendrix. Absolutely. So this was like, this is, we don't do that. We expect that from, um, we expect to hear that rock sound from Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. We don't expect it from Prince. Um, and uh, so I think also that Guyana is still very much a Christian country. Mm. So you know, Prince is um. If 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 you're a born again Pentecostal Christian type, Prince is a bit dodgy, isn't he? And so I remember people <laughs> saying, I remember people saying that Prince was satanic. Really? You know, whereas, yeah. I mean, I, I I don't know how how he would have felt about that, but no, you can't be you know you can't be walking around in bikini pants in trench coats, like and 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 and, and behaving like that and expect to. Um, become anything more than the cult not in a country like Guyana anyway whereas um, Michael Jackson was incredibly hip um, but Stevie Wonder was um, he was more like a sort of prophet elder to the Guyanese yeah. people I would say um, that you know when, when, when we spoke of of Stevie Wonder, it was it was with real reverence and respect. Um, but Michael Jackson was very much for the young people, yeah. And Prince was for the young people in the know. And I think, um, I've always felt different. It's it, it's just circumstantial. But um, after Croydon, being the only black boy in my school, going to Guyana, being the only English boy in my school. You know, that sort of made me feel a little bit different to people. And then I was a born again Christian at my high school when everybody else was um, going out and partying and having sex. And so I always felt a little different to everybody else. And so I suppose that um, I appreciated that there was something different about it. Plus, I'd also had enough years, because I left here when I was 11, of watching Top of the Pops. And so one of the things that appealed to me about Prince was that he sounded like the stuff that I remembered from Top of the Pops. And I yeah. and, and Leaving here in 77, it was, um, sorry, leaving here in 78, it was sort of uh, the first chapter of British punk in a way. Yeah. And we'd just come through glam rock. And uh, I remember my sister and I used to, um, my sister and I loved Bohemian Rhapsody. So I went to Guyana and suddenly that music didn't count. It was like only the songs that were big on the American R&B chart that really registered um, at Guyana Radio. And so rock was gone and Prince brought it back into my life, I would say. You, you touched on Top of the Pops there. Um, and I think anybody sort of growing up in the UK, that was, you know, that was your gateway into seeing what pop star, you know, what your favourite pop stars looked like. And, you know, you got to see your, you know, the only place really, because not, not, not many people I knew could afford MTV, you know, that was where you would watch music videos and you'd, you know, you'd see the likes of Prince, Jacko and uh, Madonna and such. And, it always was just this 
absolute sort of pinnacle of, 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 you know, my week. It was like Thursday nights, you watched the pops. It was, it was all about Thursday nights. Am I right in saying that, that you performed on there with Bernard when Yes come out? I did pop Top of the Pops three times with right. Bernard. Tell me about the first time you went on Top of the Pops. Did it, did it, because I'm fascinated with people that have, have been on Top of the Pops because it's such an institution, you know, in the UK. Did it deliver everything that you expected it was going to be? Because my my vision as, you know, as a young lad was, once you go on Top of the Pops, you walk out of there with like, firstly, a million pound in the bank. And like, you know, you're instantly a superstar if you've been on Top of the Pops. And, and then you just get, you know, absolutely chased down the road by loads of sort of, you know, screaming children, all just absolutely adoring what you do. Tell me the realities of going on Top of the Pops and, and was it everything you'd hoped it would be? Uh, it was terrifying. Um, and it was all terrifying. I, felt, I, I think I spent most, most of 1995 after Yes came out being scared. Of what? Be- of scared of of what so, of um attention um you know i life had been a certain way and that was okay and then suddenly everybody recognized me and that was really weird and i remember even though this is this is not an answer to your question, I remember after the top of the pops passing a crowd of teenagers outside Swiss Cottage tube station because I was living up there at the time. And one of them, I just heard one of them as I passed saying, that guy was on top of the pops. And then they were just they, they were all over me. And um it's difficult to know what to do with that. So um Rick Blacksill, I remember the producer of Top of the Pops, I remember being really warm. Um and um it was a very giddy experience. I mean, it, it, it was like a slow sort of um, state of shock. You know, um, when I heard that Yes went into the charts, it was like, you know, all of this stuff is um, unbelievable for me and, and, and difficult for me to process. And I think that um, the, 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 the career I've had since then might actually be a reaction to, I don't know if, I, if I'm actually made for this level of attention. Uh, but um, my favourite thing about uh, visiting Top of the Pops was um, that it was at Elstree and that's where they filmed EastEnders. And in the canteen, the EastEnders characters came in. (laughs) (laughs) I was watching EastEnders at the time. I remember um, uh, Barbara Windsor in a leopard leopard skin Mac. Like um, she, she, I, I was standing in an entrance or something and she just walked by and she looked at me, she said, all right, darling, and <laughs> kept going. <laughs> what a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I remember um my friend Patrick and I were there one afternoon and the and 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 the um the, the canteen was really empty and we heard this dirty laugh kind of, uh, behind us. And we turned around and Steve McFadden and Ross Kemp were sitting at a table having lunch and a laugh together. And we were like oh. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you said about you didn't, you know, you, you struggled with the, the the instant, you know, onslaught of attention that that, that mm. come with, um, you know, going going on the pops. And did what kind of conversations was you having with Bernard at that point? Because he'd obviously come from, you know, being very high profile in in Swade at the time, and then kind of disappeared from Swade and 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 then have returned with, you know, and 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 I, and I honestly mean it's one of the greatest you know, records ever made in, in Yes. I, I, I think it's as close to perfection as, as you can ever get, David. And uh, and and, Thank you. and, Thank and, you. and and your vocal on that is, is sublime, mate. A, 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 absolutely beautiful. Um, and was you having conversations with, with, with Bernard about this kind of media attention and, and, and attention from people on the streets? Because obviously he must have experienced that. And from what I gather from documentaries I've watched on on Swade and Bernard he seemed quite uncomfortable with that in Swade as well he seemed very much like wanting to be the studio guy like what kind of conversations we used to have in there um we didn't speak much um this might seem strange but um Bernard was actually quite guarded because of what he'd just been through with Swade sure and because of um some of his experiences with um fans and um, being chucked out of the group, basically. 
which is how I, I, I understand it works. I think the thing that I've um, understood about Bernard over time is that he's a regular bloke, really. I mean, he's um, a family man. Yeah. At that time, at that period when we, when we were working together, he had a ritual. He'd get up in the morning, put on a boiler suit, and go to work yeah. in the studio, nine to five. And then when 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 that was done, it was uh, it, it it was it was family time. And beyond that, I mean, he really the, the way that he sees it, he is working for a living. Yeah. You know I mean, so that's that that was certainly how 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 it was at the time. Whereas I was just kind of in this kind of um whirlwind of um well, well I don't know what I was expecting. I mean, I you know, to me, the difficulty is that I'm I'm David, I'm David McCalmont. And the success changed people towards me. And I was thinking to myself, I'm still him. I went to Tower Records to do a signing and um, a, a, a young man stood in front of me to get to, to get his record. Um, and, 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 and he was nervous and he was struggling. I mean, I've, I've done the same thing, so I know exactly what he was doing. But I was like thinking, yeah, but I'm David. I haven't changed. Yeah. You know, I just met this guy at the Jazz Cafe. And he said that he had been listening to a lot of Dusty Springfield and that he wanted me to record a song with him. I went to his house, <laughs> recorded a song with him, and then um, it went through all those processes and then this happened. But I'm still the guy who was, you know, who went to this guy's house yeah. because I liked the sound, because he had me at Dusty Springfield. And so, um, yeah, it's... He's he, he, he's he's a regular guy. I, 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 I've worked with him and been been with him plenty. And he really just likes to be in a um, limited company where he's comfortable and he knows everybody. And everything outside of that is is, is, is a difficult place for him. I think. Tell me the song that soundtracked your years clubbing, please, David. Uh, okay, um, this is th 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 this one was also easy. I mean, I, th I think it's just it's my favorite dance song ever. It's um, Rainy Lassiter doing the lead vocal on Hideaway with D Lacey, and it's a deconstruction record. And I was always stunned that it was only two and a half minutes long. Yeah, I mean, probably. I, I, I mean, I, I understand now that it's that, that it's an edit and that there are seven, eight minute minute versions of it out there, but it's just. Um, I don't think there's another dance record that sounds like this. Yeah, it was such a singular moment in 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 dance, but 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 that kind of crunchy grinding um, thing that somehow manages to be weightless and not tempo, yeah. with her just some um, serving attitude for days over it. I mean, I've, 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 I I I I love it to this day. Yeah, was clubbing yeah. a big thing for you? Hmm? Was clubbing a big thing for you? Um. Well. <laughs> <laughs> There's one way to answer that question. I've been to Ibiza 14 times. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I loved it. The minute I realised, um, I remember standing in a club one night and realising that um, the music that I was dancing to had been designed for where I was dancing to it. Yeah. You know, the scenario that that, 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 that that it existed for no other reason. Yeah. Well, that's what it felt like to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I frequented um, Busby's when they had the cop there, which was kind of a kind of queer core. I don't know if you've ever heard of queer core, but it, you have? No, no, I haven't. No, no, please explain. Yeah, it's sort of, if you think about um, New York Dolls, Blondie, yeah. that sort of thing being reworked with a dance flavor. That sort of CBGB's era, yeah, yeah. There was that. The, the, there was that in the uh, mid nineties, early noughties. That the, the, there was a lot of that around. So I like that. Um, went to heaven a lot. Um, there was a happy house, um, so happy soulful house club called Queer Nation that I that, that I was went to pretty much every week. And then I went to uh, Ibiza for the first time in nineteen nineteen. I got nineteen ninety nine. And got absolutely hooked, and um, then it got the, the number got so outrageous that I decided, hmm, probably best not because every time I left Ibiza, it was painful. I mean, right. you can imagine why, but I remember uh, one time I left Ibiza, I was covered in glitter, sweating, 
and crying. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you, you get into a certain state and you don't want to leave. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, my, friends at the, my friends at the time called me um, Ever Ready. Because I'm, I, I, I didn't stop dancing. And there's something about dancing and dancing and dancing for hours that when the dancing stopped, it's still going on in your head. Yeah. I think I think there was actually a cartoon character called Ravy Davy in Viz or something. That's right, there was. No, I was like, you know, but 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 you get on the ferry to Fort Montera and you listen to the engine. It's just like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, look, we we, we touched on um, you know some of the early days and and you know and and, and that was uh, unfortunately a fair few years ago now and. Uh, and and as you know, I've watched your career, you know, through to the the, the recent work you've been doing with Sean. Um, you've chosen a ridiculously difficult industry to uh, to pursue, uh, yet you've maintained success. I asked you about confidence earlier, and now I want to ask you about drive. Uh, are you a, are you a really driven individual? Um, okay, I'll tell you how I see it. Um, yeah, I love to sing. I love writing. I love, um, I don't, I'm, I'm not mad about studios. I love the stage. And um, in, in many respects, the reason I love the stage is because once it's done, you can go home. And yeah, you haven't got to think about it again. Whereas uh, studios take you into um, underground rooms with no windows and air conditioning, which I don't enjoy at all. So thank God for the new age that we're in, whereby you don't have to do that anymore. So um, I recorded the last album with Sean on the 18th floor of a tower block overlooking London. It was, and, 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 and it was great. But I think that I'm a daydreamer and I sit around thinking about, um, you know, ideas. Oh, that would be really cool. That'd be really cool. And I'm not doing anything about it. But um, somehow this thing has happened whereby the, I, I auditioned for Thieves, which was the first group that I, that I was in, I mean, in in the early 90s. And then um, Bernard got in touch with me, um, David Arnold, Craig Armstrong, Hi-Fi Sean. They all got in touch with me um, d during, d during one of my daydreams. So I would say that my collaborators are the people who kind of coax me back. Yeah. Which is why so much time passes between records because I'm sitting around daydreaming, thinking, "Oh, that would be a good idea, wouldn't it?" But then um, the phone goes, or Facebook, you know, um, has, has, you know, I, I met Michael Nyman and Sean on Facebook, but um, they've said to me, and of course, being David, I've been like, you know, why are they asking me? But they've said to me, "Do you want to do something?" And I've said, "Well, yes." So I've been very lucky, luck, lucky with um, who has approached me, but 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 that, that that that's why I'm still around doing this. Yeah, keep daydreaming because if it's people like that that start getting in touch when you're daydreaming, you're doing something right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it, 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 it's worked out really well. I'm very encouraged with, but, but um, the the, the Sean um collaboration feels like a blessing because he's really driven and um, he wants to get a record out next year. Yeah. Um, and I've never done that in my life. You know, it's been a few years that I've released something. So the idea that I might be in a situation to be um, prolific is exciting. Fantastic. Sean's obviously um, back out with, with the Soup Dragons as well, right? He is. He is. I've been um, a very good vocal coach. Because I have, um, mo I've, I've moonlighted as a vo as, as a vocal coach um, in at, at points, and um, I've been having like nice long conversations with Sean about you know how to manage it because he's because now that he's working with me, he's actually quite happy just doing the music and focusing yeah. on that. But being but 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 returning to be um, a um, lead singer has been a bit of a roller coaster for him. I can imagine. So I, you know, are you breathing right? Are you like, you know, <laughs> using your resonators correctly? <laughs> are you using diagram? <laughs> I'm gonna um I'm gonna take you home for track six, David. And um if you could tell me a favorite song from an artist from your home county, please. Ha ha ha, you have played into my dastardly plan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, okay. Pontification time, soapbox time. The greatest singer to come out of Sorry, is Julie Andrews. 
Um, I um, I adore Julie Andrews, and uh, I, I I I love her the way that I love a singing teacher. I don't know why, but um, when I was young, my mother bought me a record, and um, she, she, and she was very specific that she got it for me, and it was the Sound of Music album. And this was the original Broadway cast recording with uh, Mary Martin, mm -hmm. who it was written for. But um, I learned all of the songs from her, and then I heard Julie doing them, and that and 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 that um, that, that 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 on a level with Art Garfunkel, that was absolutely transporting. I listen to her every Christmas. Um, I love that she's seen as the um, proper quintessential English rose and she is anything but um, the, 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 you know um, many people will look at her and, and not know that in 2008 look, look look at her life and career and not realize that in 2008 she um, was uh, she revealed that she was the child of an affair she was born in Walton Thames um, she was a hoofer she um, worked her way up from um, vaudeville to being one of the great legends of, 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 of stage and screen and i just think the world of her and um this is a song that i go back to all of the time largely because um the vocal is dry there's no reverb on it or anything it's just that um purity but um if you um if you want to learn enunciation and diction and breath and 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 and, and um, ha head notes how to, how to get all the way up there you know Julie um and may, may, maybe a little bit of Babs but 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 Julie's um girl really I mean I think I remember Peter Curran a few years ago approaching me and like saying David you know do you want to like sit down and maybe talk about doing a documentary and I said yeah I want to make a documentary about Do Re Lump <laughs> Do Re Me and um he was like what and I think that Julie Andrews was given the most significant job in the history of musical um, cinema because, and and I, and, and I want to canvas my, my, my the artist of my generation because um, you listen to Do Re Mi and not only does it explain what music is, but it teaches you how to write and Ever since I heard that song, I've ever since I heard that song, I've known how to write one, because in the middle of it, um, she, the, the 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 kids say, but it doesn't mean anything, and she says, so we put in words, one word for every note, and it goes a little bit something like, when you know the notes to sing, and bang, that's the moment at which I became a songwriter, and I know that I'm not the only one, and Julie Andrews is the person who gave the world, Julie Andrews is the person who gave the world that. So yes, I'm I I esteem her very very highly. And this is this song is called something good from the sound of music. Wonderful, perfectly answered question. I love it's Julie. <laughs> it's your last track, David, and I'm going to um, ask you to be tastemaker. And it's a song that you think many people may not know that you would like them to hear, please. Uh, it's hot fun in the summertime by Sly and the Family Stone. Um, I think one of the things that I often think is that um, there's all of this music on earth that I haven't heard at 56. And there's a very real possibility that my time on earth will be done and I will not have heard the things that I really appreciate. Every summer, I am um, compiling myself a Spotify playlist for the beach <laughs> and this year I went to a place called Malamoco and uh, um, last year was great it the, the 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 playlist was called on the beach and it was all songs about the beach and this year it was just summery songs and I saw researched googled songs about the summer and hot fun in the summertime came up hands up I'd never heard this song before and it once again, it was like you know, where have I been? How yeah. have I lived this long without this song in my life? It's just beautiful. It's um, summer is female, you know, end of the fall, and there she goes again. Bye, bye, bye to the summer days, and then uh, 
they have just got these wonderful euphemisms in it. Like I, 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 I can um boop 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 if I want to. <laughs> and then there's um this lovely kind of Sesame Street section where they talk about being out of school. And um, it's just um three minutes of three minutes of heaven from the wonderful sublime, from from from, from the wonderful slide in the family stone. And I, I know Sly in the Family Stone, but somehow this one I mi I missed. Yeah, I missed. Mm. Well, we make it easy for people not to miss it because we put together. Uh, you just mentioned Spotify playlist. We put together a little Spotify playlist to accompany the podcast with with all of your song choices and obviously oh, excellent. Uh, excellent. some of your work as well, um, David. And with that in mind, what can people expect from uh, from you in the next uh, you know months as, uh, that are coming our way? Well, um, I've been working um, with our historic royal palaces in the University of Leicester on a film called Permissible Beauty, which is um, a composite contemporary portraiture series based on um, 17th century paintings at Hampton Court Palace. And so at the moment I'm promoting that. So it's going to be at the Welcome Collection from October 26 for six months. That's an uh, exhibition called The Cult of Beauty. It's for free, so you can go there and you can see the film. And I'll be up and down the country promoting that. Um, Sean and I are going to start um, getting ready for the tour. We're hitting um, Glasgow, Manchester and London in February. So look out for that. Um, it's um, I talk about it all on my, on, on my Instagram page. Um, we are working on the next album and we are hoping that the album will see the light of day pretty, pretty soon next year. Um, oh, you can see me doing the George Michael songbook on the, uh, in, in December at the Twickenham Exchange. So check out the Exchange Twickenham website. Oh, fantastic. And that's one of the things that I do, which really fulfills the whole live, lo love to do live thing. And that's um, songbook shows. So I did the um, Prince songbook in September and I'm doing George Michael songbook in November. Oh, wonderful. You, you touched on Instagram. If people want to keep up to speed with you, is that the best place to, to, to find out everything that you're up to? Yes. Okay. Well, if it's all right with you, David, when this episode comes out, we'll, we'll tag you in it. And if people aren't following you already, then they can do so. Stu, thank you. It's been really good talking to you. David, it's been absolutely delightful. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to press Thanks, stop. Thanks for having me on this. You have some, you, you, you have some pretty um, significant people on this. Well, I've got to be honest, David, as I said before, uh, I've spent my whole life obsessed with music and I do regard Yes as the greatest single of all time. And uh, so Thank it's you. been really lovely to to speak to the the, the the voice of that record. So, yeah, so thank, thank you. you so much. I'm going to press okay. stop. Don't go anywhere.